Welcome to the channel everyone. The Bangkok Post published two small articles on the assassination of Mr. Ban. The first article was published the very next day, being the 5th of February 2002. Now please don't worry if you are struggling to read the text in this image. A magnified copy of the article appears later in this video together with a copy of the second Bangkok Post article published on the 28th of September 2014 which of course was 13 days after the very brutal, very savage double murder of Hannah Withridge and David Miller, a double murder with which many of you are no doubt familiar. I feature eight Kotao deaths in this video that occurred prior to the murders of Hannah and David. Mr. Ban's death is merely the most conspicuous murder of the eight and the most brazen. The other deaths are all suspicious save for one which is at worst a case of manslaughter. I've been criticised in the past for highlighting forgotten and covered up crimes and deaths that happen to be two decades old as if they are not important. One motivation is to challenge misinformation and even disinformation such as the notion that Hannah's and David's were the first and only murders on this allegedly normally peaceful island. Secondly, as the thumbnail suggests, it's important for YouTubers with bigger platforms than mine to find easy access to reliable information and references on historical murders and deaths. To follow is a one minute clip in which I challenge some of the initial BBC reporting. A tropical beach and now a crime scene. Police reinforcements were rushed to this normally peaceful island to help investigate what appears to be a brutal double murder. This has to be the most unlikely place you'd expect to see a crime like this. And that, of course, is what the locals are hoping, that it is just a ghastly one-off and that once it's solved, they'll be able to recover the laid-back vibe that's brought so many thousands to visit over the years. Jonathan Head, BBC News, Koh Tao, Thailand. The earliest of the eight deaths is that of Ian Jacobs from Birmingham, who died on the 18th of January 2000. Featured here is a thumbnail for a 28 minute video, which includes interviews conducted for Sky Crime with Mick Locke, who was Ian Jacobs' friend, and with Sue Buchanan, who actually saw Ian's body. It also includes a much earlier interview I conducted with Mick Locke. There's a link, of course, in the description below. I have some additional mainstream media references on the screen here, and also I have links in the description below. The Death Island podcast is a superb reference point for anyone who wishes to research the various murders and suspicious deaths on Koh Tao. As promised, here is a magnified copy of the very first Bangkok Post article about Mr. Ban's murder. Feel free to pause the video at any time. Now is the time where I point out that there are in fact two competing versions on what happened with the killer. The first version, which you will see from the Bangkok Post, 
is that no one was ever apprehended or arrested or charged in relation to Mr. Ban's murder. The second competing version can be found in the Death Island podcast, and there is a link below, and it can be found in some of the videos on my channel, and also in the book The Curse of the Turtle by Sue Buchanan. In that version of events, a pig farmer, who was also the local butcher, was convicted for Mr. Ban's murder, but it's difficult for an outsider to know which of those two versions is correct. The third case involves a 37-year-old Swedish man who vanished 19 days after Mr. Ban's assassination and was found hanged on the 25th of February 2002. The following is an English language translation of a Norwegian news article. The headline reads, Norwegian boys in Thailand, hostages for a dead man's debt. Kotal. For almost four weeks, the Norwegian brothers aged 16 and 20 respectively have lived alone without money or passports. The boys ended up in trouble when their mother's Swedish partner, 37, took his own life on the holiday island of Koh Tao in the Gulf of Thailand, leaving the boys and their mother, 40, heavily in debt. Throughout the long luxury holiday, the Swede had given the impression that he had money and was going to settle the bill. This is the reason why the boys are now sitting as hostages for a hotel bill they have no way of settling. The boy's Norwegian mother left them four weeks ago when she thought she would be able to raise the money at home in Norway. But no one will lend her the money and now the 40-year-old woman realizes that the family needs help. But no authorities have been able to offer help to get the boys out. The debt increases. Redensgang has met the mother in Oslo and the boys in Thailand. The young boys now find the situation very unpleasant. The 16-year-old said, People are friendly, but it's uncomfortable. The debt increases every day. Now we owe almost 50,000 Norwegian krona here, and there are three living wages down here. The passports have been seized by people we owe money to. Someone follows us when we move around the island so that we don't run away. The Norwegian authorities are aware of the boy's situation, but have understood that the family would solve the problems themselves. The local police on the small island cannot communicate with tourists in English. When after several weeks in Norway, the mother has not been able to raise the money herself, she and her sons ask for help from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Child Protection but there are no rules that dictate how a situation like this should be resolved. It was the dream of starting a new life in the tropical paradise that was the start of the tragic and very special case. The Oslo woman and her Swedish partner were on holiday on the island of Koh Tao last November. They completely fell for the beautiful island, which is considered the best place for divers in Thailand. They plan to raise money and then start a bar themselves after the new year. The partner assured her that he had money. The woman then travelled back to Oslo while he remained on the island. At home, she and her eldest son, 20, worked around the clock in December and were able to save 32,000 Norwegian krona, which they brought with them when all three of them travelled down in January. Don't skimp on anything. The woman quit her regular job as a bartender when she left. The mother said, My partner claimed he had hidden his money in a safe place. When we came down, we started spending mine and my son's savings. My partner thought we shouldn't save on anything and that the boys should take care of themselves. So we rented motorbikes, went diving and lived well in the restaurants there and paid with our money. The money ran out. 
The passports had been pawned by the motorbike rental companies, but everyone thought they had more than enough cash. Towards the end of February, it was time for the Swede to start spending his money. Then came the problems. The man had probably taken severe psychological damage from the long stay in a country where alcohol is extremely cheap. The mother said, In the first days, he was allegedly exposed to revenge. He sustained injuries. The motorcycle allegedly ran out of gas. Actually, we think it was self-inflicted because he didn't dare admit that he had no money. On February 23, the man disappeared, once again to retrieve his hidden money, he claimed. Two days later, the family was told that they had to come to a remote house on the other side of the island to pick him up. He had been found hanging from a ceiling beam in the unoccupied house. The place was the same where all the family and friends had celebrated the man's 37th birthday earlier during the stay. The mother said, I dare not think about whether he did it himself or whether others took his life when he was going to collect the money if he had money. She contacted the Swedish embassy in Bangkok and the deceased was transported home to Sweden. A spokesperson for the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs said, It is true that we have received a report of a suicide on Koh Tao. We have helped notify relatives here in Sweden. Can't get alone. The passports of the Norwegian family were confiscated. In negotiations with the owner of the bungalow where they live, the woman got her passport back. She was also allowed to borrow 10,000 baht, probably a few thousand Norwegian krona, from the owner to get to Norway to raise money. The mother said, I traveled six hours by boat to the mainland and took a train up to Bangkok to change my plane ticket. I only had a cheap ticket with Aeroflot and had to be in Bangkok for five days before I got home to Oslo. At the Norwegian embassy, I was told they could not help the boys, but I was able to borrow some money privately from an employee so that I had food. Once at home in Norway, it was not as easy to get a loan as she had thought. Since she had quit her job, her previous employer could not give her a loan. Banks and credit institutions will also not give loans to the unemployed. The mother said, both at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and at my local social welfare office, I have been told that they cannot help. But then it must be wrong. The youngest is a minor. He is a child. I need help getting them home. Due to the pressure she lives under, she is unable to work now to earn money. The mother said, as soon as they come home, all three of us will work to get the money back. And she acknowledges having contributed to the bill and wants to pay back. At the local social welfare office, VG is informed that the caseworkers are bound by confidentiality. We were not allowed to speak to the case manager who had met the woman. Now today I want to talk about a young Japanese fellow by the name of Hiroshi. He also went by the name of Hiro, H-I-R-O, and he died, to the best of my knowledge, in 2002 on Koh Tao, immediately following his participation in what is known as a snorkel test. The few facts I have on him are that he appears to have come from Tokyo. I understand that he was a mechanic that he was approximately five foot two inches in height. And for those of you who uh, adopt the metric system, that's 157 and a half centimeters approximately. He was in his late twenties or early thirties. That's the estimate I've been given. And um, he died, as I said, in uh, about 2002 to the best of um, my knowledge, the information that's given to me. Now, for those of you who don't know what a snorkel test is on Koh Tao, it is a test or a celebration that often uh, people undertake after they have passed uh, 
part of a scuba course or when they've finished a scuba course. And uh, I'm about to show you part of a video clip. It doesn't come from the from the dive school where um, Hiroshi uh, had taken his dive master test, but it comes from another uh, dive school called Pura Vida, which ironically means pure life. I mean, I say ironically because Pura Vida diving had been involved in the uh, the death of, the deaths of uh, two scuba students. One was Rocia Gomez from Argentina. She died on her very first dive uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, also the captain of a Pura Vida boat ran over a young uh, Norwegian diver who was only eight minutes into her very first dive. He uh, ran over her in very shallow water. So it's, there's an irony that Pura Vida actually means pure life, but I can assure you that Pura Vida had nothing to do with the uh, death of Hiroshi. This is just uh, an example for you. So this is not particularly clear, but I will, and they're speaking in Spanish. What happens is that there are snorkels uh, going into a face mask and uh, alcoholic drinks are poured down those into the mouths of students who've just graduated from a course. I'll leave it there. I'll leave that there. But uh, that gives you a little bit of an idea of what a snorkel test is. Now, I understand from having spoken to uh, several people who've witnessed and uh, been involved with snorkel tests that sometimes these end rather badly and that some people become uh, very ill, uh, violently ill and wind up passing out on uh, the beach afterwards. Now, the information I have is that Hiroshi was a non-drinker and he had a very bad reaction to um, some very powerful alcoholic drinks that were poured straight down his snorkel and uh, he had a very bad reaction. He was taken away. His uh, stomach was pumped out at a nursing station but he passed away and uh, the next morning uh, four people uh, carried his body away but it was um, a very unfortunate death. Uh, it, was, it certainly wasn't murder, there was no intention to kill him um, but it was an, an unfortunate death really caused by some negligence and uh, but the worst part is that it was just covered up and people don't know about it and this is one of the reasons why I'm bringing it to your attention now. The fifth death that I'm covering here is that of Yoshi Sazawa, also known as Charlene. Now Charlene was a Japanese scuba diving instructor and a long-term resident of Koh Tao. I've got it on very good authority that she vanished on the 18th of June 2004 and that a number of searches went out for her, including of her house or bungalow on Koh Tao. She was not there, but eventually her body was located on the 25th of June 2004 in the jungle, not too far from her house. The interesting thing is that when I started posting some videos about Charlene's death, some representatives of the Royal Thai Police published a series of press releases in which they stated that Charlene was actually found inside her house with a suicide note, contrary to half a dozen other sources.